So, once again, we're turning to James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So, church family, we're going to spend some time walking through this passage together. Uh, there are mostly three sections to the passage, and uh, the second section, which is point two of, our, of your notes, we're going to have to spend more time explaining than the others, so... It's going to seem a little uneven. I'm going to go fly through point one really fast. You're, thinking, you're going to think we're going to be done in ten minutes, but we won't. So, number one. First idea is this. James says that both our good times and our bad times should drive us to Christ. Again, both our good times and our bad times should drive us to Christ. Uh, I take this from verse 13, where he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him Now, because he's going to move on to talk about sickness in future verses, we might read the, the word suffering and just turn it into health-related suffering. But in the Greek here, this is a general word, for all kinds of suffering, not specifically sickness. We'll get to sickness in just a moment, but really for any struggle. So, are you struggling? Pray. Are you cheerful? Sing praise. In other words, when is a good time to come to Jesus? Right now. When is the right time to look to the Lord? Right now. Are you having the best day of your life? Then come to the Lord and rejoice with Him in it. Are you having the worst day of your life? Then bring your struggles to the foot of the cross and cry out for his mercy and his grace and his help. And here's the truth of it. Most of us aren't having the best day of our lives or the worst day of our lives. What what is actually happening is really, really bad, stupid things happen right up next to really, really good, awesome things. Amen? Isn't that more like how it really works? Well, in that day... That's still a lot of opportunities to come to the Lord. Come to Him when you're struggling. And come to Him when you're doing great. Be neither a fair weather nor foul weather friend of Jesus. Do both. Rejoice in Him when great things are happening because there's a certain sort of mercenary Christian who only comes to the Lord when things are going really bad. Like, in other words, he's kind of like a, a, a bottle of Tylenol that you only approach when you have a headache. But that's not the kind of relationship you want with the Lord of the universe, I don't think. Look to him in those good times and thank him as the giver of all good gifts. Rejoice in him and thank him for his kindness that he has given you so many good things. And when you are suffering, come to him then too. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses uh, 16 to 18, we are given given some marching orders that are to apply to all Christians in all scenarios forever. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the first verse I think of when people say, I'm not sure what the, the will of God is for my life. This is the first place I go. This is the will of God for your life. There's probably more, but there is not less than this. 
Pray without ceasing. When's a good time to pray? Right now. And also right now. And still now. These are always the right times to come to the Lord in prayer. I was reminded a couple of times this week as I was studying of uh, that precious old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and particularly the line that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Beautiful truth. This is a good moment to come to God. And so is the next moment. The darkest moments, the brightest moments, these are all excellent times to turn your attention to the Lord, church family. Can you hear me on that? Number two. After telling us that any time's a good time to pray, any time's a good time to seek the Lord, now he's going to dial in on a specific time that is regrettably common in the human condition. Um, he's going to start talking about sickness. But really the major point of verses 14 to 16 is this. James advocates for a life of vigorous prayer in the church. He wants the church praying a lot. He wants a life of vigorous prayer. Let's look again at verse 14. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So here's where he's moving from a general suffering in verse 13 into specifically the suffering of sickness in verse 14 and following. Now, there's a lot here in this little paragraph that is harder to understand. And it could be easily misunderstood, and it could be easily abused. So I understand it to be my mission today to guard you from potential misunderstanding and to guard you from potential abuses of this text. And I've mostly done that by phrasing some questions that this raised in my mind that I doodled in the corner of my notes when I first started studying, phrasing some questions, then answering them regarding this paragraph of the text. Here's the first question. Is this text, or am I, as the teacher of this text, advocating for the charismatic practice of the gift of healing? No. No. What's in view here is not anything like the charismatic practice of the gift of healing. How we understand what the Bible teaches regarding the continuing use of some of those charismatic gifts is a different teaching for a different day, but that's really not what's in view here. Praying for healing is not seeking to operate in the gift of healing. Those are separate categories. So I want to put one of those in the drawer, close it, and not talk about it much more. Because that's not what the text is doing today. We regularly pray for people's physical healing because we believe the scriptures teach us to do so. But no, this is not about charismatic practices. That's not what James has in mind. Now, a related question. Is this text teaching that specifically church elders have some sort of special spiritual authority? to heal, because it mentions, uh, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Is, it teach, is this teaching that with the office of elder comes some special spiritual superpower for people to be healed? Regrettably, no. Kind of wish it did. Not because I, I want to be elevated, but because, man, I know the physical struggles many of us in this body are going through. And I wish it did work like that. I wish, I wish that were the case, but it is not. So my answer is that, do, do, does the office of church eldership come with it a special authority to heal? No, but we've always understood that the ministry of prayer 
is certainly a function of the work of the elders. There's no question about that. Uh, this goes all the way back. So when we were first figuring out what elders were and what elders do, way, way back in the early center point days, many years before some of us met some of you wonderful people from the old Unity Church, when we were figuring this out and wrestling with these texts so we could understand what elders are for, one passage we went to was Acts 6, which I want to draw a little bit from today. In Acts 6, the Jerusalem church is in its early days, and I would argue that the apostles, the 12 apostles, are functioning as the ruling elders of that church. And a conflict has come up in the church. There are thousands of people in it at this point. God has been very gracious to grow them very quickly. And there's an issue about how they're taking care of some of the poor in their church. And there are some people specifically who are, they're all Jews, but there are some of them who are specifically Israeli Jews, but many who have grown up in other parts of the world, which would be called Hellenistic Jews, Greek Jews, basically, meaning they grew up in the more Greek-influenced parts of the world. And there's a concern that some of the widows from the Greek Jewish part of the church are being neglected. And so this comes to the apostles, and it says in Acts 6, verse 2, The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And that, that word, to serve tables, the, the Greek word is literally to deacon, is what that word is. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So we take a lot of guidance from this passage about what our job is as elders. The ministry of prayer, ministry of the Word. Ministry of prayer, ministry of the Word. So what is James telling us about elders in this passage? First of all, it's clear that he expects that individual Christians in individual churches will have access to a plurality of elders. Is any one of you sick? Let him go to the elders, or call the elders. He expects a plurality of elders in the local church. And second, I think what he's doing is this. I think he expects that the elders should be good intercessors, because that is one of the ministry tasks of elders, as I understand it, is to pray and to pray well. So, I don't see this teaching that elders have a special anointing for healing because of their office, but I think James expects them, as a mark of their maturity, to be experienced men of faithful prayer. I think that's what's going on there. Now, having said that, let's talk about one other wrinkle from that, which is the oil. It says, uh, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. What is this about? What is the purpose of the oil? So, I, I asked two questions of myself as I was studying this. First, is it medicinal? Uh, because in this time, uh, some oils were used in medicinal ways. Uh, not in some of the odd essential oils, if you breathe the fumes from this oil, it will make you happy ways. That's for other chemicals that exist in this world. That's not, <laughs> that's not what we're doing here. But rather, oils were used in, in medical practice. If I recall correctly, this isn't in my notes, but if I recall correctly, it mentions the good Samaritan rubbing oil on the wounds of the man who was attacked even. Um, but nowhere in Scripture is this word for anointing with oil used to describe medical practices. And also, why would the elders be called on for medical care? That doesn't. That just doesn't click for me. Okay, it may be because I'm biased because I am a, in a room disproportionately full of medical workers. Yeah, we have a shocking number of medically trained people in this little church, and uh, I'm like the tenth or twelfth person <laughs> in priority that you should be coming to for medical counsel. I am a doctor. I'm not that kind of doctor. I have these useless theology degrees. Uh, so I don't think the point is calling on the elders for this sort of normal scientific medical care. Now, a related question, and this, is, this made me think of, so I grew up in a part of the world that is extremely Catholic. Uh, Southern Indiana is extremely Catholic where I grew up, uh, to the degree that it felt like almost every other yard had a Mary statue in it. It's just part of 
part of the culture in that area. And so I, I know a lot of Catholic practices almost as a semi-insider because I went to church with my friends, you know, like, like you do. And I'm aware that Catholic priests use oil in one of their sacraments. So the question I asked is, so I asked, is it medicinal? I don't think so. Is it sacramental? Because our Catholic friends will have their priests anoint the dying with oil as part of the ceremony of extreme unction or last rites, as it might sometimes be called, to help them to prepare their souls for death. But that seems to be the opposite of the point here in this text. So I don't think this text is a good source to look for that kind of a practice, since the point of extreme unction is to prepare you for death, while the point of this text is to pray for healing, which seems to be the opposite of that, I think. Um, so probably what I think the oil is for is something more like a symbolic action. Uh, in the scriptures, anointing often symbolizes setting someone or something apart for a purpose. They would anoint the priests. They would anoint the things in the temple, the, the furniture of the temple. They would anoint the king, and so on. Um, most biblical uses of anointing with oil seem to be for consecration, would be the, the theological word, to set something apart for a particular service in the kingdom. Uh, however, I've, I read some arguments this week, and they, they resonate with me to some degree, that this sort of anointing with oil is also a symbol of asking for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because just as the scriptures speak about being anointed with oil, sometimes the scriptures speak about being anointed with the Holy Spirit or anointed by the Holy Spirit. Um, so perhaps what is going on with telling the, the elders to pray using this oil is praying for the healing presence of the Holy Spirit on those people. So let me say this. That's not weird. It, it might be unusual in some American church practices, but it's right here in the Word. It's not weird. Uh, uh, there's, there's oil in the elder's office right now, and always has been. Uh, in fact, uh, in the old center point days, we had that one very specific glass bottle. Do you remember that, Mark, with the cork in it? Yeah. I don't think that thing made the trip over here. I don't know what happened to it. But uh, we, do, we keep oil in our office to this day. Because, again, we, we understand the scripture, again, not to be teaching us anything charismatic, but just to do what it says. To, to do what it says. Let the elders anoint them with oil and pray for their healing. So, we do. Symbolic actions aren't weird. Communion is a symbolic action. That's not weird. Baptism is a symbolic action. It's not weird. Lifting your hands in worship or kneeling in prayer, these are all symbolic actions that are normal parts of the Christian experience. They're not weird. They're just communicating things of the soul. They, they're, they're not mandatory. You're not failing if you can't. Like, for example, uh, our, our dear friend Chad, who we just heard about, who must have his hands in casts or will very soon have them in casts, I don't think he's failing to worship God well if he can't lift his hands well right now or if he can't receive communion or anything else. That's not a spiritual failure. It's just these actions have a special potency to them. The things they stir in our minds and stir in our souls are valuable. Now, another question that comes up from this. What's up with this material about forgiven sin and confessing sin? It says in verse 15, If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, this is the part that I'm least clear on. And I always try to say that when I'm not 100%. If I ever assert something, if I say this text means this, it's because I've studied it and I thoroughly believe that this is what it means. But whenever I'm not 100% sure, I, I have always told you so and always will tell you so. But I'm not allowed to skip this text or skip verses in this text. That's not in my job description. So here we are. I don't think I understand this perfectly, but let me share some thoughts that came up from my study of this. Uh, I believe that scripturally, there can be a connection between sin and sickness. 
For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul is giving the Corinthian church instruction regarding proper use of the Lord's Supper because they're making a big mess of it. And here's part of what he says in verse 27. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who drinks, or excuse me, who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And look what he specifically says. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Oh. Right? <laughs> This is, this, is, this is part of the reason why we try to handle the Lord's Supper very carefully. We try to practice commune in a very specific, non-casual, non-flippant way. I don't know for sure we're doing it perfectly right, but I am terrified of getting it wrong. I don't want to lead my flock into a position like this, eating and drinking judgment on yourself. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. I think part, it would take a while to unpack that passage, but I think the mention of discipline, what he's up to is suggesting that the Lord may use sickness as disciplines in our life. And he is not wrong to do so. He is Lord over all. He's sovereign over the, all the world. He's sovereign over your body. And if he ordains to use physical illness, physical weakness, physical failing, just plain getting old <sighs> as disciplines for our soul, he does no wrong. Can we say amen to that? That's a challenging truth, but can we, can we hold on to it? Can we cling to it as precious and valuable? So, can there be a connection between sin and sickness? Yes. From a, from a theological perspective, Sickness and death are obviously intrinsically connected to sin. Sickness and death are only here in this reality because sin is here. Amen? Before sin showed up, those other things didn't exist. So there is certainly some connection. However, we don't want to push that too far and automatically presume sin on someone. Uh Oh, you got a sore knee? Huh, what you been doing with your life? Uh -huh. yeah. Headache? Sinner. That's unprofitable. Let me say more about that. To automatically presume sin on someone because of some sort of physical suffering is, first of all, the error of Job's friends. I would refer you to, I can't use it as a reference because it's the entire book of Job, but the entire book of Job. <laughs> I just didn't want to read all that today. But that was the error of Job's friends, was assuming a very simplistic correlation that, oh, Job is facing suffering, he must be in terrible sin, and God's busting him for it, when that wasn't the case at all in that story. Also, we have this example from uh, John 9. It said, Jesus was passing by, and as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. So we could just stop there, and I've made my point. But let's finish the sentence. But that the works of God might be displayed in him. God may have kingdom, sovereign, God-glorifying Kingdom advancing purposes for your suffering. So, biblically, I don't. I want to say that there is not some sort of one for one correlation between sin and sickness. As if if you committed three units of sin, you are guaranteed to receive three units of sickness. That's just that's not the biblical pattern. But these realities are tied up with each other in some way. And, and you know that. Do you pray well when you're sick? I don't. Man, the worst days for me are when I'm sick in the pulpit 
I hate those days. To the best of my knowledge, I've only ever missed three ser Sunday sermons for being so sick I couldn't get up here. Y'all, everyone here, except for the visitors who are here, have seen me preach sick many times. Because I just, I, I don't want to not, I, I want to stay in my post and do the work that God's given me to do. But I feel like I'm wearing a spiritual blindfold those days. The metaphor I use all the time is I feel like I'm a baseball pitcher who's got a blindfold on. I've got a vague idea where home plate is and I'm throwing the ball at it. Am I hitting it? I don't know. Isn't that your experience? Surely some of, someone else must have this experience where when you're physically not well, you're spiritually a little off. Amen? I know you have the opposite experience of if you're emotionally or spiritually messed up, your body tells you about it sometimes, doesn't it? Surely you have the quivering stomach when you've been in an argument with somebody. Surely your hands have shaken in, in fear of a meeting you're about to have. Surely sweat has come, although it's not hot. Right? All these realities are tied up with each other, and that's way too complicated for me to try to unpack today. But I just want to acknowledge that, yeah, these things, there's some overlap of the Venn diagram here. I don't know how to explain it completely. I just know that it is so. Now, next question. Look at verse 15. The prayer of faith will save the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Is this teaching that healing is guaranteed, and therefore that a lack of healing shows a lack of faith? Well, you weren't healed. Well, then that wasn't a prayer of faith. Well, here's what we would do with this. At face value on this verse, you could take it this way. And I'm afraid this is what some of our, our sloppy, charismatic, faith-healing friends do. Okay, when, uh, when, because they do teach this, that's why they're so vulnerable to the prosperity gospel. And when they teach that if you're not healed, then you're the problem. Your faith is insufficient or whatever. That is, that is vicious and cruel. And if I don't stop talking about it now, I will rant about it for 45 minutes. That we're not, that's, not, that's not the game we're playing. If this text was the only biblical teaching on this topic, I think we'd be kind of forced to receive it that way. But, as you know, we build doctrine on the entire testimony of Scripture, not just individual isolated verses. So, a wrong conclusion, I think, would be, if they weren't healed, then it wasn't a prayer of faith, implying that the prayers didn't have enough faith. First, our, just our experience shows us that sometimes people do experience healing and recovery after being prayed for, and sometimes they don't, right? We pray for people's recovery, they recover, awesome. We pray for people's recovery, they don't recover. That happens too. So, secondly, I've got this example from 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the, revela of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's response, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So let me summarize that. Paul prayed for some sort of healing or deliverance from this thorn in the flesh. I tend to think it was a physical malady. I've got a whole theory about that, but that's another half hour I can't do right now. Paul prayed for this healing and was told, no. No. Keep in mind, this is a man who raised guys from the dead. Don't tell me he didn't have an anointing to heal on him. He clearly did. Don't tell me his faith was lacking. Come on. There are some things we can accuse Paul of, but that is just that's not on the top 25 list. That's not it. Here's the difference, I think. And this, this is very clear in the life of Paul, who, again, can make blind people see make seeing people blind, <laughs> cast out demons, heal people, and even raise someone from the dead when he literally bored that guy to death with his teaching and the guy fell out the window and died. It's a good one to meditate on. There's a difference here between 
operating in the gift of healing and praying for healing. You see it? Because when we're praying for healing, we're asking. We're not telling. We're asking. And God may have a different purpose in the illness. That was God's direct answer to Paul. It is now, Paul, I've got a different thing going on here. And your healing is not on my agenda. I have other things on my agenda. There are other things I'm working toward in your life. Folks, let's just go to the big one. Being dead. It is simply not God's will for people to go on living forever. That is the natural order of things. The scriptures tell us he has ordained the number of our days. We can't add a one to them. God, in his predetermined work and purpose, has he knows exactly how long he intends us to live. And whether he gives you many days or few, he has done no wrong. He is Lord over these things. It is not God's will for people to never die. That's part of a future plan, which we'll explore some other time. Rather, Psalm 116, verse 15, which uh, Mark and I were discussing the other day, is something we think about often when, when Christians die and we're attending their funerals. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It doesn't happen outside of his will. It doesn't happen outside of his control. In fact, if you're in Christ, it's the most blessed thing that could possibly happen to you. This is why we pray, come Lord Jesus. Or if you're planning to hold enough for a while, just go ahead and bring me to you. That's fine too. Dying in Christ is, is a win. It's a win. Uh, last question that comes up from this paragraph. Why is confession of sins mentioned? Why is this a piece of that puzzle? What's that there for? It says, therefore, in verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, first of all, remember my three rules that I've taught you over and over and over again, but we're going to review them anyway, okay, for, for interpreting the scriptures. There are three questions we ask. The first question is, what does it say? Second question is, what did it mean? Meaning, what did it mean to its original hearers? And then third is, how does it apply to us? Or how can we apply it to us? Let, let's, let's operate in that first question. What does it say? Because I know what you think the text said, but I want to I wanna point out that it probably doesn't say what you think it said. Because of the, the cultural model we live, live in, it doesn't say, therefore, confess your sins to the elders. It's not what it says as if we are priests in confessional booths and we hold some sort of special office regarding this. Now, might you consider confessing your sins to, to a fellow Christian and maybe an elder? Yep. But there is no command that elders are the only people who can receive confession because we do not deliver absolution like a Catholic priest does either. I don't get to say your sins are forgiven. I don't get to do that. That just gave me the willies doing that from the pulpit just right now. I don't get to do that. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? I think because confessing sin equips us better in the battle of sanctification. It can be a great grace to have someone to share your struggles with. It also helps us to pray more specifically for our brothers and sisters. And this is an especially sweet gift of God, so that when your sin is still small, and again, if I'm, if I'm going to do a conversation about smallness and bigness of sin, that's another half-hour talk I don't have time for today. Just, so just grace me to let me say it this way for this moment. While your sin is still small, confessing it may help it stay small. Asking someone to come alongside you with it, Okay. instead of you sitting on it and hiding it and letting it fester and grow in the darkness until finally it goes Nova and you've embezzled $500,000 from your company or whatever else, whatever whatever the newspaper says, because I guarantee you what it will say is Unity Baptist Church member busted for X, Y, and Z. Church deacon, 
church pastor busted for this. That's what it will say, and the reputation of Christ will be harmed. Confess to each other. Share your struggles with each other. When we're fighting the fight for sanctification well, we will pray better. I'm certain of it, and I'll say more about that in point three in just a moment. So let me wrap up point two with just saying this. What is the link between prayer and confession and healing? My answer is, there is clearly some relationship there. Those, that Venn diagram does have some degree of overlap. But I feel like I've explained about as much of it as my current understanding allows for. So if you walk out of here being mad because you still got questions, that's fine. I'll walk out with you still having questions too. I'm still working through some of this myself. Let me return to the point. James advocates for a life of vigorous prayer in the church. Who does he want praying? Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So who does he want praying? You. You're the one that knows about your suffering. You know about the cheerfulness that's in your heart right now. You pray. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. The elders, the church leaders, let them pray. Continuing on. Uh, verse uh, 16. Therefore, con confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Who's supposed to pray? Everybody. So the only people James wants praying is you, church leaders, and everybody. That's, that's his comprehensive list of who he wants to be active in prayer. You, church leaders, everybody. The Lord, through James, I believe, is saying that he would have all of us regularly striving in prayer, both individually and together. Strive individually. Strive along with your brothers and sisters. Strive with your leaders and let your leaders strive with you as you seek the Lord in prayer. Number three, James describes the access we have through prayer to the power of God. He, is, he describes the access we have through prayer to the power of God. We have access to God's power. The mechanism for that is prayer. What does that look like? Verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now I've got, I've got some references here to 1 Kings 17 and 18. Uh, that I'm going to skip over in the interest of time today. But I really recommend that you look at all of the Elijah story, which is in this part of 1 Kings and into the first bit of 2 Kings. The point being is that God directed Elijah to pray that the rain would stop and that the rain would start. And Elijah did that. And the example of Elijah, James would say, first of all, is he's a man with a nature just like us. In other words, Elijah was human, Elijah was not in any sense a super saint. There is not some special category for people like that. Elijah was just a dude. It's a deep and profound theological word. He's a dude. That's all. But he prayed in accordance with God's promises, and he saw God's power at work. Everything Elijah did in 1 Kings 17 and 18 was according to God's direction. So th that helps us understand some things. Because, for example, when we're praying for people's healing or recovery, do we have a specific word from God regarding whether or not any particular person in our lives will be healed or will not be healed? No, we just don't. But pray. Pray vigorously. And in this last point, I'm going to argue, pray with big faith. Pray as if you actually believe that this magnificent, sovereign God can do these things he says he can do. Pray like that. Let me give some instruction there. Jesus says in John 14, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son, or that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. 
1 John 5, verse 13 to 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that he that we have asked of him. John writes so awkwardly. Ah, sorry. Literally my least favorite Bible author. Just can't stand the way he writes. No offense, dude. I'll see you someday. We'll talk about it. When we pray, we are to pray according to his will and for his glory. We are to pray like Jesus would pray. That's what I think it means when he says, pray for things asking in my name. That doesn't mean we have to magically attach the phrase in Jesus' name and they have any prayer. It's fine if you do. There's nothing wrong with it. You are, you're in Scripture if you're doing that. But I know that wasn't meant to be a command that all, all prayers must have at the end of it because no prayer in all of Scripture ends that way. After Jesus has given that instruction, not a single person ever prays at the end of the prayer says in Jesus' name for the rest of the Bible from the Gospels onward. It's fine to do, but it's not a magic formula. That, well, since I said that, now you're locked in, God. You've got to do what I say. That's not what that's for. Whether it is praying for things according to his will and things that match his character. Praying like Jesus would pray. Bringing the kinds of things that he wants us to bring to him. Uh, an analogy I thought of to explain this a little better might be if uh, my son Gabriel... Um, he might walk into the room with Monica someday and say, hey, uh, Dad asked me to uh, let you know that I need $20. Will you please give me $20 out of your purse? That's one way to say something. Here's a different way to say it. Mother, in the name of Dad, give me $20. One of those is a problem. <laughs> At least it would be in my house. The, these prayers are not for the making of demands, okay, or to strong arm God into doing anything. They are praying in His will for His glory. He goes on to say in verse 16 the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Let, let me unpack that a little bit. Because the immediate question you're asking yourself is Am I a righteous person? Here's my answer eh, Yes and no. Yes and no. Here's why. Is Jesus your Savior? Have you received him as your Lord? Have you accepted his sacrificial death for you, for your sins, bearing the, the weight of the guilt of your sin and the wrath of God for those sins on the cross? Have you trusted in that? Has he moved you from spiritual death to spiritual life? Are you a temple of the Holy Spirit? These are all basically ways of saying, are you saved? If so, then are you righteous? Yeah. Because we, by God's grace, participate in the righteousness of Christ. Again, the mission of the cross was not just to bring you forgiveness, but to grant you righteousness. Forgiveness just gets you back to zero, but you'll be back at negative 500 real quick. The righteousness of Christ belongs to you if you are in Christ. And without that, we have no standing whatsoever to come to God or to relate to God in any sense. I have jarred many non-believers when I've communicated to them that God is under no obligation to hear or respond to their prayers. Why would he be? What obligation does he have to someone who is rejecting his saving work through his son to hear and answer their prayers? So, am I a righteous person? And a related question, is James referring to that, the righteousness of Christ that we have through Christ's sacrifice? Or is he referring to the personal sanctification that we grow in in Christ? And honestly, I think a little bit of both. That's why I said, am I righteous? Yes and no. Yes and no. You have no standing to come to God in prayer whatsoever unless Christ is yours and you are his. None. None. Having said that, let's talk about how some of the scriptures would talk about this topic. Psalm 66, verse 18. 
If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Proverbs 15, 8 and 9. The sacrifice of the wicked, so they're sacrificing, but they're wicked, is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he loves him who pursues righteousness. Remember that phrase, pursues righteousness. That's key. Proverbs 28, 9. If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So, let me be clear. Nobody's perfect. Not even close. Not even close. We do not teach spiritual perfection at this church. Spiritual perfectionism, I should say, at this church. We don't teach that, that actual spiritual perfection is possible within this life. But as you heard me say 80 gazillion times, and I'm going to keep saying it because it's such a big, important truth, there is an enormous difference between battling your sin and embracing your sin. In both cases, you're a sinner. And make no mistake, this is a room full of jacked up sinners who need Jesus. We will never be anything but that on this earth. We are jacked up sinners who need Jesus. But what is your disposition towards your sin? Are you fighting? Are you battling against it? Or have you negotiated with the enemy? Are you allowing him to have some ground in your life? Are there places where you are embracing sin? If you're on a willful trajectory of rebelling against God and refusing to pursue increasing righteousness, then let's not pretend that that will have no effect on your prayer life. Right? Let's, let's, just, let's not pretend that's not going to have any effect. Now, again, God doesn't answer our prayers based on our perfect, perfection. That's extremely good news. But let's not pretend that whether or not you're striving to pursue righteousness in your life has no bearing on this topic. First of all, I don't know how much you'll pray. Honestly. You know, when I'm messing around, I don't go look for mom and dad to see what I'm doing. I just don't. If I'm doing the wrong thing. When the boys were young, I was most alarmed when the house got quiet. That meant they were building a bomb. <laughs> or something else like that, right? Right? Some of you who raise boys, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when they're loud, at least you can hear the gunfire and you know what's happening. When it's quiet, that it's, oh, not good. The house is on fire. In the same way, man, if you are pursuing righteousness, if you're pursuing growth in Christ, it's reasonable to think that will have a positive effect on your prayer life. It's reasonable to think that you're showing an intention to move toward God. And I think the scriptures would back me up in this. So again, this is a very fine hair I'm trying to split it's a very tiny little bullseye I'm trying to hit, but I think you see what I'm getting at. You have no righteousness apart from Christ. And yet, pursue righteousness. That will equip you to pray well. Let's pray together now. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity to hear this truth. And God, we do pray for our prayers. We pray that we'll, we will be vigorous prayers, that our life as a church body will be marked by diligent, faithful seeking after you. Father, please, in your grace, equip us where we are weak. Help us to be greater intercessors. Help us to express love and concern for one another in our prayers. Father, I pray that you'll give us chances to pray with one another even today. God, uh, put someone in our path today that we can pray with. In Christ's name.